Jeremiah chapter 42. I want to pick up in the middle of this story for the sake of time. Chapter 4, Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come. Whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. These people had asked that the man of God would pray. And then the Lord gave an answer and he said, I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be true, be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee. That it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. In other words, preacher, we want you to pray. And whatever the Lord tells you the answer is, we will obey. Because we want to hear the voice of the Lord. It came to pass after ten days, Jeremiah took it serious. After ten days, that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And called he Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, And said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom you sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you, not pull you down. And I will plant you, and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon. Of whom you are afraid, be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. Chapter 43, And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking, to the people all the words of the Lord their God for which the Lord their God had sent him to to them even all these words then spake Azariah the son of Hesheah Johanan the son of Kareah and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah thou speakest falsely the Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not thou into Egypt, and sojourn there. Can I tell you just for a moment before I start preaching? There will always be people that will tell you it's alright to be a little more worldly than you already are. There will always be somebody, because Egypt is a type of the world, But I I feel to preach to you today out of verse 7 and 8. So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus they came even to Tapanhez. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah. Take great stones in thine hand and hide them in the clay, which is at the entry of Pharaoh's house, in Tapanhez, in the sight of the men of Judah. If there has ever been a day that we needed to hear the voice of the Lord, and if there was ever a day for preachers to hear from God, we need to hear from God today. All I can tell you is, it used to be spoken in jest, Uh, Brother Scoggins, it's not his fault that he's here. The Lord has sent him here. That may be why this morning at 3.15, I could not sleep. 
my heart was heavy and I, I didn't know why but now since I have come to this pulpit I find that I look into the eyes of people including myself the man that is preaching to you who will spend eternity somewhere either forever saved with the Lord and His angels are forever lost. Oh, I understand that those kind of words come back to men from the pulpit nowadays because people are not absolutely sure if there really is a heaven or if there is a hell. But if there was ever a day to hear the voice of the Lord and obey the voice of the shepherd, it is today. I've said it before, if I ever have to be the mean preacher, I quit. But obeying God is the most important thing that any of us can do. And we are living in the last days. This world is in an upheaval. And we don't know what really is going to happen in the few short months. I'm about to allow you the privilege of being seated, but but there's people that God has sent us that He wants to change. Jesse, come up here a minute before I I let this congregation be seated. You are one that God is going to change. I begin to imagine in my mind, Lord, is this going to be a church? that just talks about the power of God? Or is this going to be a church where the power of God can change somebody? I believe that the Lord is anxious to change people. That they come in here one way and then they leave another way. Because God does something miraculous unto them. The word of the Lord to to Jeremiah was don't go anywhere and certainly don't go to Egypt. You stay right here because what you fear here is nothing to fear what's over there. I believe there's two fears I need to challenge this morning. The fear that people have in the church and the fear that you have, if I stay here, I may miss something. If, if, I, if, I, if I don't go somewhere, I might miss something. But God wants to give us a demonstration today of His Holy Spirit, His holy power, and I'm ready to see the life-changing power of Jesus Christ manifested. Is there anybody that's ready to see God do what He's already said He would do. Would you lift your hands and pray all over this building, Jesus? Anoint me, Lord. I stand as your vessel. Oh God, help me to say exactly what you want me to say today. Give me ears to hear what the Spirit would declare. And help me to say... In Jesus' name, exactly what you would have me to say. God bless you and you may be seated. I don't have any war stories. I've never been mishandled by a preacher. I've been raised in Pentecost. Not raised, but got here as a teenager. And I had the best of pastors in... Bessie and J.T. Pugh, they were our examples. It was not a steady diet as we heard today of preaching against stuff. But it was preaching for stuff. For righteousness, for holiness, for a power of God, to be pleasing unto Him, for relationship. I was very blessed to be in that environment. Uh, No mean-spirited legalism. No hatred or arrogance. It was all 
had to do with consecrated devotion and people that would challenge us to give Jesus Christ everything. It would come in the way of He adopted you, He chose you, and He gave you everything. He first became your supreme sacrifice. You wouldn't be here if He wouldn't have been willing to die for you. And the God of glory literally became a man and came down in the form of flesh so that He could bleed out for you. And if He wouldn't have come and been willing to give that sacrifice, none of us would be here today. And I heard that kind of preaching as a young convert. Never mean-spirited, never, never angry, never using the pulpit as a whipping post to beat people. They didn't have to say a lot about standards because when you preach about holiness and you preach about loving Jesus Christ and when you uh, preach about His sacrifice, it makes people want to live it and want to love it. I remember leaving an environment where Brother Pugh would get through and there would be literally a haze that would settle over the auditorium and the power of God would fill it and... Many times, young people who were not raised in church had to be carried to their cars and to their vehicles because of the power of God that would be demonstrated. I remember as just a a lad of a boy had just received the Holy Ghost in Louisiana, and I remember the youth camp that A.D. Spears preached. And when he got through preaching, people heard a train coming from across the ball field. And that train literally came to the concession stand. And people out in the concession stand fell to their knees. And people that were standing out literally fell to their knees. And I was wondering, what is going to happen? Because I'm new to this. I, I, I was wondering what... I. I hear commotion over here. I, I hear this roar coming and suddenly it came in the sanctuary and and young people on that side fell over. And then I was wondering, what's going to happen to me? And before I knew it, boom, I was flat on my back speaking in tongues. I had never witnessed the power of God. But let me tell you, What came? It was the night before on consecration. It was the night before of getting everything out of our heart and emptying our soul and, and people brought all kinds of stuff and piled it up on the altar and, and said, we don't want this anymore. And they brought all kinds of music that was not good and they piled it up on the altar only to see the next night God answer by fire and say, I, I have accepted your sacrifice and I will give you the purity of my spirit. I will give you the purity of my anointing. I'm preaching to people that are not strangers to that. I am preaching to people that knows what it's like to be drunk under the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm preaching to people that in your youth group you had all night prayer meetings that turned into a powerful move of God where people could not stand upon their own feet. Am I in the right place this morning? I'm I'm preaching to people that said I want, I, I hunger, I thirst. And I don't know about you, but I feel in San Antonio there's about to be that kind of revival. There is going to be that kind of spirit. The Lord would say to the apostolic faith, don't go to Egypt. He would tell us the same thing that Jeremiah said. Don't go to Egypt. Don't go to their worldliness. Don't go to their idolatry. Don't go to their sin. I want to be as balanced as I can be. But I don't want to be worldly. I don't want you to get a confused mindset that we can come in this church and raise our hands and speak in tongues and then go have a little wine and have a little scotch and have a little clubbing and have a little daiquiri and have a little this and have a little sex and outside of the marriage covenant and have a little adultery, have a little fornication. Can I preach to somebody that I feel God would say, it's time. Time to take a stand. You might be in Babylon, but you don't have to be affected by the spirit of Babylon. 
You may be living in the world, but you don't have to be of the world. You don't have to be like the world. He has given you the Holy Ghost and fire. He has given you everything you need to be different. And if you keep desiring the world, if you keep desiring Egypt, he's going to let you go. If you keep looking toward Egypt, he's going to let you go. Brother Tanner, get Isaiah 5, verse 1. If you keep looking toward the direction of the world, he's going to give you what you think you want. But I'm telling you, for those that will keep their eyes on Jesus Christ and will keep your eyes centered upon him, God is going to bless you. He's going to give you a ministry of power. He's going to give you a ministry of authority. He's going to bless your home. He's going to bless your children. And you've been wondering, how is my family going to convert to this apostolic? It's not going to be with you going to Egypt. They're never going to have a chance at this apostolic truth. If you go to Egypt, you're going to have to stay in the church. You're going to have to live for God. You're going to have to offer him everything you've got. You've got to give him your mind. You've got to give him your spirit. You've got to give him your emotions. I don't want to compete with Hollywood. I don't want Hollywood competing with the God in me. Did you hear what I said? I don't want Hollywood competing with the God in me. I'm going to pray that you're mature enough and you're godly enough to know what to watch and what not to watch. But can I talk to you for a moment? I remember Jeff Arnold saying this. If while you're eating buttered popcorn, watching your show, if Jesus can't come in and eat popcorn with you, you got a problem. If he can't sit down and watch it with you, you've got a problem. Can I preach in here? We need to take inventory and make sure that we're not headed in the direction of Egypt. If you raise your children in Egypt, they're going to be Egyptians. You better raise them in Jerusalem. You better raise them in the church. You better raise them in the household of faith. Read verse 1. Yes, I made sure that I planted the church in a place of fruitfulness where you could be heard by the Almighty God where your needs could be protected and preserved, that everything you would ever need, I put it in the church. I put it in Zion. I made everything possible so that you would not need to go outside of my vineyard to find anything. I planted it on a fruitful hill. I put it in a prosperous place. I put it in a powerful place so that you could have every need met. Can I tell you just for a moment that the church is a fruitful field. It is a fruitful place. It's a great place. You're not being cheated because you're not an alcoholic. You're not being cheated because you're not a crack addict. You're not being cheated because you have five lovers. You're not being cheated. The church is a fruitful place. Read. He fenced it and did what? Yes. With the choicest of vine. I built a tower in the midst of it. Made a wine press therein. He said, I planted you in a vineyard. I fenced you in not to control you, but to protect you. 
But if you insist on breaking through the fence, what has happened is you have not been content with the provision that I have given you in the church. You're not content with the healing that I give you. You're not content with the mercy that I give you. You're not content with the grace that I give you. You're not content with the love that I give you. You're not content with the purity that I give you. You're not content with the wine. You're not content with the spirit. You're not content with the anointing. Read. And now. You've got a decision to make. Just like Jeremiah said. You've got a decision to make. Here's what God says. Stay right where you're at. Don't look outside of the vineyard that you've been planted in. Stay right here. The everything that you are fearing and everything that you are afraid of, if you'll stay put, God's going to bless you. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of your family. He'll take care of every situation. He'll take care of your backslidden children. But then suddenly proud men got up and said, Hey, don't listen to that preacher. You can go to Egypt if you want to go to Egypt. You can do anything you want to do. But I'll dare say that those proud men had not been shut up for 10 days praying for Israel. They had not been on their knees. They have not been on their face. You got to be careful that you don't take a word from people that are not praying, that are not fasting, that they don't know what you need to do. They'll tell you, yes, come and get in the back seat of the car and your life can be forever destroyed by one mistake. But I've come to tell you, Your preacher's been praying and your preacher has been saying, God, what would you have me say? And he's saying, I've made a vineyard. I've got everything you need in it. I've got a wife for you. I've got a husband for you. I've got mercy for you. I've got grace for you. I've got healing for you. But stay in the church. Would you stand and shout, stay in the church? Somebody ought to shout it louder, stay in the church. Is there any parents that would help me preach for a moment? That would say, preach, pastor, stay in the church. Egypt doesn't have anything for you. Be seated a moment. I don't want to put more burdens on you than necessary. I had J.T. Pugh in the younger days of my life. I had Or Foss in the the older days of my life. There was never a more merciful man. I don't have war stories of people being beat up in the pulpit. I don't have war stories of people being embarrassed. I don't have war stories, but I've seen Or Foss when people would backslide. I've seen him go to his house and while they were in a drunken stupor they would vomit all over the, his suit and he would hug them and say honey if you can get back to the church we've got a place for you you don't have to live like this God's going to help you merciful men merciful men but I am telling you that mercy some people they, they, they don't understand the magnitude of what they have and then suddenly they go toward Egypt they start moving in Egypt's direction it's a little drink here and a smoke here and a little uh, excursion here and before you know it it has sucked you in and pulled you and has a hold upon you I don't know who I'm preaching I don't know why God would have me preach on this Sunday morning I, I know that we've heard war stories don't don't work anymore if you scare somebody you have to scare them forever to keep them in the altar but I've been wondering 
could it be that I would be preaching and I would be the dumb dog that wouldn't bark and I would be the preacher that wouldn't open his mouth and one young person could go back out toward Egypt in the process of experimentation and the truck flip over and gas begin to ooze out in the street and I didn't open my mouth. I'm telling you, God forbid that your blood will be upon my hands. I've come to tell you the world has nothing to offer you. There's nothing in the world for you. There's nothing in Egypt but hurt and pain and sorrow and difficult. We have a full-time youth pastor because we're going to invest in young people. We're going to try to give you everything. That's why we don't mind the lights. We don't mind the color. Because Egypt, with its glaring advertisements, are trying to capture your attention. Older generation, don't be too hard on us. I would rather a little lights in the sanctuary and my our babies with their hands up, shouting and speaking in tongues. You may not like it. You don't have to like it. But Egypt is trying to get the attention of our young people. It's trying to dazzle them with lights. But can I tell you, lights and strobes are not hindering a move of God. There's about to be 25,000 in Lucas Oil Stadium because there are young people that really do want to live for God. There's a hunger. There's a thirst. There's young ladies being called and young men being called. Stand to your feet. I'm not going to preach much longer. I'm just going to tell you that our answer is in the church. Everything we need is in the church. Man, it's good to see you. Great to see you. Our answer's in the church. It's not in the world. Some of you young people is going to be raised up to be mighty pillars. You're going to lay hands on people and they're going to be healed. I remember hearing the story that Brother Haney told. All the preachers were gone. But there happened to be a young man who was on an extended fast in the prayer room. And a woman came in who was carrying a dead baby in her womb. And so the secretary said, I'm sorry. This young 14-year-old had just come out of the prayer room. Because that's what happens when you raise them in Jerusalem. And you raise them with a power and an authority. And this young man was fasting and praying. I want to be used by you, God. I want to be used by you. I want to be powerful. I want to be anointed. I want to be your vessel. And what he was saying is, I'm glad I'm in the vineyard. And he was taking his opportunity and filling up with the wine. He had visited the wine press. The fence didn't bother him. He was just glad to be in the church. And he come out of that prayer room with his Bible. And he overheard the secretary saying, I'm sorry, Brother Haney's not here. There's nobody to lay hands on you. He said, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. He said, in the name of Jesus, whatever this need is, be healed. And suddenly, Brother Haney said, the baby leaped in her womb and came alive because there is a powerful, holy anointing that is upon this generation. That kind of power, Egypt can't give you that power. Egypt can't give you that authority. Egypt can't give you that anointing. You can't get that kind of anointing in the world. That a 14-year-old boy can just say in the name of Jesus. And a documented miracle can take place. You know why? That baby wasn't looking toward Egypt. He was glad to be in the church. Now listen. If you... Keep looking toward Egypt. And, and I'm going to repeat this because you can say what you want to. 
I, I really have no access to grind. I don't want to argue any politics with anybody on Sunday afternoon. I really don't. But I don't see very many people in Laredo with their fingers through the fence trying to get into Mexico. But you can see people lined up from Juarez, every border town. They'll have their hand through the fence looking for a better life, hoping in a better day. And God's wanting to know, why are you wanting out of this vineyard so bad? Why do you want out of the church? Why are you looking to the world when I've got everything you need right in the church? I've got healing in the church. I've got miracles in the church. I've got everything you need in the church. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Would you lift your hands? Lift your hands. I'm looking for a better country. I'm looking for a greater anointing. I don't want my baby to know what it's like to be carried out of a bar trunk. That's why I've been very careful not to put a burden on you that's going to make you rebel and hate God. Brother Kilgore was so gentle with people. He would give them the benefit of the doubt. These are the men that I was exposed to. Not mean-spirited legalists, but people that were holy from the inside out. But it just makes common sense that if you're a real father, you're not going to let your babies play in the street. You're going to set parameters. And you're going to say, wait a minute. That's the street. Preachers have to preach and say, that's the world. That's the line. That's the line of demarcation. You can't go there. It's not because anybody's trying to control you. Just protect you. And God, and God has given families. Hold that for me. Hey. God's given families a chance. He would have been raised on the streets of D.C. watching people kill one another. But God brought him to a vineyard where we can protect mom and dad. We can give them a safe place. We can give them a place where God can protect him. We can teach him real holiness. We can kiss him. We can can hold him. We can say, no, you're, 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 you're not an Egyptian. You're a part of the royal household of faith. You're not an Egyptian. You're going to be raised in the church. You're going to be given an opportunity. You're not a drug addict. You're not a gang member. Oh, we believe that God will let those people in the vineyard. But we just don't want this baby leaving the vineyard and becoming something else. Hi. Hi. You did it four times yesterday. You're not going to do it. Hi. Yeah. He's smiling, but he ain't talking. He's just like some of you. I'm smiling, but I ain't talking. I just want to know, is anybody glad to be in the church? Is anybody excited about being in the church? Is anybody thankful to be in the church? Come on, somebody. You keep looking toward Egypt. He's going to let you go. Hands raised. There are mighty oak trees all over. They're all over Texas. There are mighty oak trees all over Texas. And an oak tree is just an acorn that refused to give up its ground. And if I can get you to understand, if you'll let your roots go down,
you'll begin to grow in the church. You'll begin to reproduce. God will bless you like you never dreamed you could be blessed. I need to move my focus from Egypt. I don't want to listen to proud men that say it doesn't matter. I don't want to listen to voices that interrupt the voice of the shepherd and the voice of the Lord. I want to hear the voice of the Lord. We're not going to give you a rule book when you come here. We're going to offer you something greater. We're going to give you a relationship with the God of glory. The one who came in the form of a man and offered his hands and his feet. And blood came out of his body. He said, I'm doing that for you. I'm dying for you and your children. When he got through dying, he he appeared in a resurrected form to his disciples. He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. When that demonstration came and fell upon 120 people, and Peter would continue after that to preach the message. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children. Children. Jerusalem's about children being reproduced. It's about somebody taking a stand and saying, I will not give up my ground. I will not leave. I may not be perfect, but I don't want to go anywhere but the church. Lord, I came from the world. And young people, if I know you've not had the experimentation, take it from 90% of the church that has. Take it from my mother for 21 years away from God who finally called and said, Honey, this would be my last day on earth, but I had to give you a call and tell you myself. Egypt has nothing to offer you. I remember going to Metairie Clinic and watching my stepdad as they tied him down and psychologists tried to detox him from a life of alcoholism. That may be why your pastor is so adamant to preach because I've seen people lay in their own vomit. I've come home from church with the stench of regurgitation in the carpet. I know what it is to live in sin I remember making this pledge to God God one of these days I'm going to get married and when I do I promise there won't be cigarette smoke in this room I breathed it enough but God I pledge to you I, I want an environment where you can come and talk to me an environment of purity Holiness. Where you're always welcome and always there. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, there were times when the cousin called in Egypt began to beckon. Come to Egypt. Come to Egypt. Come to Egypt. But Jeremiah, the prophet, said if you go to Egypt, there's going to be judgment for it. It's going to be a high cost to pay. There's a high cost to pay. And I wonder, while every head is bowed, if there's people that were raised in the church, but you went to Egypt, and you paid a high cost for it, would you raise your hand? I went to Egypt, and I paid a high cost. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 25, 26, high cost.
cost me more than I ever dreamed. But today the Lord is here in such a sweet and mighty presence. I've, I'm touched by the fact that all of you raised your hand or here. That means as long as there's breath, you can come home and you can be restored and you can be mended. And that's how I was raised. I remember Brother Foss saying, aren't you going to pray for her? I said, well, she's kind of habitual at praying. He said, oh, well, then I'll pray for her then. And I watched my shepherd go over and take her by the hand and said, honey, I know you've done it before, but he's going to help you today. God's going to strengthen you today. And it was that touch that that shepherd prayed. I watched it, and she stuck. And her traveling days were over. And she ended up living for God because the shepherd had faith. If you can just get in the presence of God, He'll help you. He's not giving up on you. He's going to take care of you. He's gentle. But there are many that have walked out the door, started in the direction of Egypt, and they never made it home. Brother Nazarian, how many in your youth group never made it home? How many from our youth group never made it home? They never made it home. Like the young lady that went, went was flying to Mexico to make a drug deal raised in the church only for us to get the call that the plane went down and they're dead. No survivors. Because the call of Egypt was more than the call of God upon their life. The call of Egypt was more than the call of God. If you're here and you're hungry, you're thirsty, I don't care what you've done. The world has nothing. If you're through with the world and right now you're, you're feeling this call, you feel like He wants to hold you and minister to you touch you and make you something you never dreamed you could be then I want you for a moment every head still bowed, every eye closed I want you to just raise up your hands and say Lord here I am I want you to touch me today Lord I'm looking towards your cross I'm looking into the face of your mercy would you just raise your hands all over this building and say Lord I'm coming to you today I'm moving toward the church. I'm moving closer to you. I don't want anything Egypt has to offer. I don't want anything it's got. Lord, I want what you have for me. While nobody's looking, would you just slip out of the aisle? Would you just start coming to the altar while nobody's looking? Just slip out of the aisle. Just say, Lord, here I come. Lord, a consecration unto you. I want you to change me. I want you to rearrange my thinking. I want you to do something in me. I want you to change me today. I want you to change my thinking. I want you to get a hold of me. I want to consecrate something to you like I've never consecrated before. I want to give you everything I've got. Would you come? He's merciful. Oh, He's tender. He is wonderful and holy and mighty.